in the previous video, compute the improper integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x to the fourth power with respect to x. If you feel comfortable with how that worked, in this video, we do the same improper integral, except now it's going to be over 1 over 1 plus x to the 2n power, where n is a positive integer. Now, our technique is going to be exactly the same. We're going to use a line integral in the complex plane. The things we'll need to add, we're going to use a geometric sum, and I'm going to need the Euler formula for sine. Now, the answer that comes out is very nice, so we should definitely check this on a few points. Now, if I let n be equal to 1, okay, we're looking at pi over sine of pi halves, which is just pi. So, if I take this improper integral here, the way we would normally solve this, I let x be equal to tan theta. Then, when we compute the antiderivative, we get inverse tan, and then we're looking at pi halves minus minus pi halves, or pi for our final answer. So that checks out. For n equal to 2, we worked that out in the previous video, so we got pi times square root of 2 over 2. If we use the formula, we're going to have pi over 2 times sine of pi fourths, sine of pi fourths is square root of 2 over 2. Then when we clean this up, we know we have pi times square root of 2 over 2, and that checks out. Now, we just pick some numbers that are a little bit further out. You can check them with Riemann sums. So if I let n be equal to 5, okay, we have pi over 5, sine of pi over 10. Put that in the calculator, I get 2.033328, and so on. If I go to my computer, I can approximate it with a Riemann sum. So we'll have the graph of our function. I'll go from minus 10k to 10k. We're going to use rectangles with base length 0.01. So we fill in our graph with those rectangles, take the sum of their areas, and then we crank out 2.033. So this is pretty close. If I let n be equal to 10, then we're looking at 1 over 1 plus x to the 20th power. So formula gives me 2.0082. And then if I work out the same Riemann sum with this function, we get 2.0082. So that's pretty close, and I'm convinced that this formula is true. To compute our improper integral, we apply the same procedure that we used in the previous video. So we're going to calculate a line integral in the complex plane using the residue theorem. Now, what do we need for the residue theorem? First, I need a closed curve. So the curve we're going to use, we we'll go from minus r to r on the real axis, then we'll return along the semicircle. Semicircle is contained in the circle, the radius r, centered at zero. I orient everything positively, so we parameterize, we're going counterclockwise. Next ingredient we need for the residue theorem, we're gonna want a function that's holomorphic in this region, except possibly at isolated singularities. Now the function that we're using 1 over 1 plus z to the 2n. It's a rational function, it's reduced. So the only singularities that it has are poles. They're only finitely many. So that means if we let r be large enough, we're gonna catch all the poles in the upper half plane. Now, the residue theorem then says, if we take this line integral, it's gonna be equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of our function at each pole. Now, what makes this work, if we let r go to infinity, then the part that we're integrating on the semicircular arc is gonna run down to zero. Okay, we won't show that here. You just adjust the argument from the previous video, and that's gonna be using three circles. So, it's gonna put the focus on this statement here. Okay, if I want the improper integral, that's just gonna be equal to two pi i times the sum of the residues of our function at each pole in the upper half plane. Now, our focus is on finding the residues at the poles in the upper half plane. Function is one over one plus z to the two n. So our poles are gonna occur where the denominator is equal to zero. So we're gonna solve one plus z to the two n equals zero, or z to the two n is equal to minus one. We could solve this using Dewolf's theorem. So exponent is 2n, 
4 minus 1, if we put that in polar form, I have the modulus, or r, is equal to 1. The angle is equal to pi. So minus 1 is back here on the real axis. Okay, so the angle goes out by pi. And the distance from the origin is going to be 1. The recipe for our roots, the new modulus, is just going to be 1 raised to the 1 over 2n power. So that's going to give us a 1. Then our new angles are just going to be, take the old angle pi, add all multiples of 2 pi, and then we divide by 2n. So that's going to give us k times pi divided by 2n, where k is an odd integer. Now, if we assemble that data to get our roots, okay, we'll call the first root omega, which is pi i over 2n. Then we'll have omega cubed all the way up through omega to the 2n minus 1. And that's going to give us all the roots in the upper half plane. Okay, so the picture here looks like this. If I have omega to the 2n, I'm going to get a minus 1, and that's going to be right here. So we're going to have n roots in the upper half plane, another n roots in the lower half plane. Each root occurs with multiplicity 1. Now, that's going to mean we have simple poles when we factor out 1 over 1 plus z of the 2n. Next, we want the residues at our poles. So, since we have simple poles, our usual procedure would be factor out the denominator, multiply by z minus the point where our pole is, then evaluate at our point. In this case, it's going to be too messy to work with. Instead, I want to use Lahopital's rule for analytic functions. It's going to give us a much cleaner answer. So, if our point is omega to the kth power, what I'll do is I'll take our function, we multiply by z minus omega to the kth power, and then we take the limit as z goes in to omega to the k. If we evaluate, we get 0 over 0, so the Hopital's rule applies. So I'm going to take derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom, and then we're going to take the limit again. Derivative of the top with respect to z is just going to give me a 1. Derivative of the bottom is going to give me 2 times n times z raised to the 2n minus 1. Now, if I try to evaluate at omega to the kth power, we get something that makes sense. So I have 1 over 2n times 1 over omega to the k raised to the 2n minus 1. Now, this actually simplifies nicely. First, if I take omega to the k raised to the 2n, well, omega to the 2n is minus 1. If I raise that to the kth power, which is going to be an odd integer, we're going to get minus 1 again. So that's going to give us a minus sign. What's left over is going to be omega to the k to the minus 1. So if we bring it to the numerator, that's just going to go up as omega to the k. And we have that our residue is minus omega to the k divided by 2n. Finally, we can put everything together now. So we have 2 pi i, sum of the residues of our poles in the upper half plane. So for the residues, I could factor out a minus 1 over 2n. That'll leave us with omega plus omega cubed all the way up through omega 2n minus 1. So those correspond to our poles in the upper half plane. Now, to simplify this, I'm going to factor out an omega. So it'll leave me with 1 plus omega squared plus omega the fourth all the way up through omega squared to the n minus 1 power. This we could simplify using a geometric sum. So if I have 1 plus x up through x to the m, that can be simplified to 1 minus x to the m plus 1 over 1 minus x. Here, m is going to be equal to n minus 1. x is going to be equal to omega squared. So we'll get 1 minus omega to the 2n over 1 minus omega squared. Now recall, omega to the 2n is equal to minus 1. So our numerator is going to collapse to a 2. And for our next step, I'm going to take the minus sign out in front, push it to the denominator. So I'll give you omega squared minus 1. I'll also take our i, put it near the 2. So I'll have a 2i in the numerator. And then this omega, I'm just going to write as 1 over omega to the minus 1. So if I push this omega to the minus 1 through, I'm going to have an omega minus omega to the minus 1. Then this is going to be formula for sine. So our Euler formula for sine says 
sine of theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i. So this is just going to be 1 over sine for the angle that goes with theta. That's going to be pi over 2n. So we know we finally get to our answer. We have pi over n times 1 over sine pi over 2n.